I am uh, Chris Carpenter. I'm one of the faculty of the Division of Emergency Medicine, and I get the honor of introducing our next speaker. Um, Corey Waller is a friend who I met um, in 2013 when uh, Randy Jotty approached me and said, we've got a big problem with uh, people who come back to the emergency department time and again. Um, lots of names for those sorts of f folks, the frequent flyers, uh, frequent attendees, uh, and, and there's some people around the country who are really being very creative with problem solving around this population. And my hometown is Grand Rapids. Uh, and. Randy said there's a guy there named Corey Waller who's doing some really innovative work at Spectrum Health, and we should go meet him and see what his ideas are. And so we had the honor of going to Grand Rapids and, and learning about uh, Corey's clinic that he put together. And uh, it's basically, uh, it, Corey, correct me if I get the details wrong, but it, something like 50 visits to an emergency department in a year qualified you to get into his clinic. He never had more than about 100 patients because he became their primary care provider. And he had a team, a social worker and a nurse, and he would do a, a very intensive intake evaluation of all of their ED visits and their clinic notes and figure out w what was the issue that kept bringing them back to the emergency department then meet with them once a week. And, and he, had, he was the only physician for them, 24-7-365. Uh, and the day that we got to spend with him, his phone never stopped ringing. Uh, th these are the people who we see in the ED time and again for a variety of social reasons um, and medical reasons. And some of them have substance abuse disorders. And um, Corey um, has a background, trained in emergency medicine, was an emergency physician for years and is now getting back into emergency medicine, but then went and did a fellowship in, in pain and addiction medicine and use that expertise to really help these folks. And, and his program was tremendously successful in Grand Rapids. He's able to cut down the number of visits these patients made to the emergency department significantly um, at obvious significant personal expense to himself. He invested a lot of time and energy and effort and ideas into this. And so he has now transitioned to the Camden Coalition, and we're honored to have him here today. His position is um, Senior Medical Director for Education and Policy at the National Center for Complex Health and Social Needs. And he's in charge of developing all the training and live te technical assistance for their online programs that they have, um, a, a tremendous resource. I think his expertise is very unique, and it is something that's going to help us in this St. Louis community problem solve around this population and this very challenging issue. So with that, I'll turn it over to Corey. Great. Thanks, Chris. All right, so every time I hear that, I just I have like flashbacks and like uh, PTSD of being on call for two and a half years straight. Um, and I think if my wife was in the room, she would have that same like hot flash of me at three o'clock in the morning walking into our bathroom having a conversation about what's going on, Louise. <laughs> no, I, no, I, yeah, I, we have an appointment at se seven. But no, I, I mean it's at seven in the morning. I'm going to see you. And I mean. I, all right, just let me know what's going on. <laughs> and then 45 minutes later, back to bed. And then at 7 a.m., she would still be there. So, so you know, um, experience through attrition is kind of the reality of uh, what we've done in medicine. But what I'd like to talk about today is really what I've learned in that experience and what that means for um, how we should be approaching patients with addiction. And he said a large portion of those patients that I saw in my clinic had addiction, but I'll, I'll be specific of um, we identified a thousand patients who had been in the emergency department 10 or more times per year over the last three years, two out of the last three years. And, uh, and when we looked at those patients and we did deep dives, so we did deep evaluations individually of each of those patients, we found that 85% of those high frequency utilizers met criteria for a substance use disorder and not mild. And that's excluding tobacco. If we add tobacco, it is 100%. So this is not a, a disease in which we, have to, we can ignore in the specialty of emergency medicine or primary care or that, but it's also one of those things that we don't really do a good job of identifying patients to start with. And every time a diabetic or someone who's pre-diabetic or near diabetic or you know, walked next to a donut incorrectly, like shows up to an office and they get a blood glucose, right? You know, we check that as soon as they walk in and we're like, okay, it's, uh, it's 98, so we gotta keep an eye on that, or it's 104, what'd you, what'd you have this morning? But what percentage of primary care actually screens for addiction on a routine basis? Less than 10%. What percent of OBGYN screens for addiction on a routine basis? Less than 10%. So we're not even screening for a disease that is the crisis disease of our age, and, and yet we have evidence-based treatments for. So 
What I want to do during this talk is to get you to really understand what addiction is and how it causes the brain to have changes that create a behavior that we can interpret and the reality that we can create an ecosystem around these patients with rock solid evidence to get them treated and safe and functional and happy. And whether that function means back to school, back to work, back to their family, just back to themselves. All of those things are what we have to focus on. And it's not about, you know, how long are they on a medication or if they're on a medication or which treatment pathway is best. We'll walk through some data around what it means and some of the myths that have been perpetuated within addiction medicine. And I think a really important slide is up here is this. I have zero pharma, zero device. Um, all of my stuff is nonprofits. I am sterile when it comes to uh, an outside influence as far as that, uh, which is why they don't ever want me to go and talk at a pharmacy thing um, for anybody or a device thing because I'm just honest about the data and that's what we're gonna be today. Uh, Dr. Schwartz did a great job of talking about the problem. Uh, you don't have to know the numbers, just look at the curve, right? That curve, that curve. This one sneaks in, this is benzodiazepines. Let's not forget that opioids don't exist in a vacuum. A lot of patients end up with their, when they overdose, they overdose on a combination of medications, not just a single opioid. And we're starting to see that a little different with the synthetics because when we added in fentanyl, carfentanil, sufentanil, uh, then what we get is someone uh, who has a deeper sedation, less breathing, and a more rapid pathway to that respiratory cessation. And they're pretty refractory to getting that, that life-saving medication, Narcan. Has anybody treated a patient uh, with a suspected carfentanil overdose? Yeah, so I treated one under a bridge about two weeks ago in Camden. Um, and I, we intubated him under the bridge and we gave him 10 milligrams of naloxone. Normally two milligrams puts him in profound withdrawal and very angry. Um, it took us 10 just to get him breathing, a little bit. And, uh, and on toxicological evaluation, there was nothing else, no alcohol, no benzos, and that's normally what it is. It was purely the, the volume and type of medication that he got. So we're dealing with something that's not just heroin or not just opioids, like those weren't enough, right? Now we've added in you know, some of the things that we call an elephant tranquilizer, which is actually true. They're not over speaking that. It's utilized in veterinary medicine specifically for large game um, sedation. And, we got here, as Dr. Schwartz said, through um, chronic pain, pushed by manufacturers, blah, blah, blah. The one I want to push on is the bottom one. We knew it. We absolutely knew this. We knew that there was only a paragraph in the New England Journal. We knew that there was crappy evidence behind every single one of these things. So for anybody to stand up and tell you that we're gonna you know, blame it on you know, somebody telling us something, I, that's a cop-out. This is the largest iatrogenically caused conundrum in the history of the United States. We did this. Heroin has been here for a long time, right? Prescription opioids have not. So we did this based on the evidence, and the reason we did it is because it made everybody happy. Patient shows up to your office, they have pain, they have suffering. We feel like we have pain because we only have 15 minutes to see you and you're yelling at me. We give you an opioid. I'm happy, you're happy, next patient. It solved a lot of problems with a single prescription. But what happened is, is we didn't seem to track the fact that even if we could treat acute pain with this drug really well, it was also treating suffering, which is a very different thing than a signal that goes from a nail going in your foot to the part of the brain that tells you you have pain. The suffering is how we attach ourselves to that pain emotionally and how we interpret that around our world. That will also temporarily be treated with an opioid, but it doesn't fix it. It just lets it kind of build and we lose the capability to have the, the right modalities of emotional stability to treat that. We lose the ability to cope when we use the chemical to do that for us, for, these, uh, for, for especially chronic pain and, uh, and the suffering that goes with it. So the basic things, and the pendulum is a good one because I have heard of a number of primary care docs that be like, I'm just, I'm just not writing opioids anymore. Well, what about the 300 people you have on your panel on opioids? We're just gonna have to get off. Well, where are you gonna send them for their evaluation for you know, treatment of pain after that? It's not my problem. I, they literally will say that, not my problem. It is our problem. So if you work in the medical field anywhere, it is your problem. It is my problem. Wah, wah, wah. Read the book, read the journals, learn it, and do it. 
don't cop out. This is a solvable problem. This should actually be a fun challenge if you're a medical student or a resident early or even late in your career. Because I'll tell you, doing rule outs for PE and cardio, you know, you know, acute coronary syndrome, neat. Now I can do one scan. I got a triple rule out. Looks at the aorta, a PE, and a heart. Whoa, that was really mentally challenging. That's not. What's mentally challenging is taking someone who is socially, emotionally, and chemically deranged to the point where they're making choices that they don't even know they're making to choose a drug over their kid, a drug over the job, a drug over livelihood. And we're going to talk about how they get there and how we can fix it, but we have to just own this. So we need three things to survive, right? You need food, you need water, you need dopamine. Now some will say, all right, we need oxygen, but you also need skin, but we're not going to talk about that. So let's just focus on these three things, right? So, so come with me on this. So we need food, water, and dopamine. Now, dopamine is important because it is the chemical in the brain that is responsible for how we interact with people around us, how we you know, create a relationship, a mother-baby bond, motivation to do better when you've done something good and somebody patted you on the back. This is a chemical that is required for every aspect of our life when it comes to reward because our body doesn't do anything if we're not rewarded. That reward may be, I'm hungry, I ate, therefore I craved food, and so the reward is, I'm no longer hungry. It could be, I'm sad. I see someone who I love. They give me a hug. I'm no longer sad. That's the reward. There's a normal pathway to reward. And, and as we do this, we need to understand that we have limits of what this reward system is supposed to do. The reward system is so well known now and so beaten up within neuroscience at NIDA and Elliot Gardner and people like Joe Epkarian at Northwestern who've dug into chronic pain and functional MRI stuff that we now know all the parts responsible for reward and we're going to focus on two, the nucleus accumbens, the ventral tegmental area. For those of you who are not medical, tough. My patients know these things. They leave and they will talk to their family doctor about why their nucleus accumbens isn't working today and they feel like they have a low hedonic tone. They have that conversation because it is important, just like when we educate them about a broken arm and which bones are broken and what we have to do, we have to start educating them about the neuroscience responsible for what's going on. It's tough when we don't know it since we got less than an hour of training throughout all of our medical training for pain and addiction. So we're going to learn it today, and when everybody leaves today, you're going to know more about the neuroscience of addiction than all the medical students in the country who graduated this year. So, which is sad. I don't know. It's like, yay, but boo, it's sad. So when we look at this, we now know through studies where they did micropipetting on animal models where they would put in a little bitty micropipette in these parts of the brain, and then they would give them, you know, normal stimuli. They would give them candy. They would give them drugs and see what happens with dopamine fluctuations. And then we correlated that to a picture on a functional MRI. So we were able to look at this on a, as a brain was working, and then we could correlate the amount of stimulation based on how dense the signal was. I know we have a few neuroscience people in here, so the voxel morphology and density of what that found was able to be tracked, which means I could take a picture to tell me how rewarding something was. And I could take a picture to determine how much dopamine is sitting in that part of the brain at any given time. This is important because it allowed us to start understanding what normal looks like even before abnormal. So on a normal day, right, you get up in the morning, you have your cup of coffee or your three cups of coffee, and then you come to something like this, that requires motivation. Anytime I use the word motivation from now on, I want you to think dopamine. Anytime that I talk about dopamine, I want you to think motivation. They are interchangeable. So on a normal day, you need a certain amount of dopamine or motivation. That's 50 nanograms per deciliter. That's the average kind of dopamine floating around in the nucleus accumbens when you get up, get your coffee, and go. Worst day, like the day you don't want to, you know, you get on the phone, you fake vomit on the phone to your boss because you don't want to come in. You're like, I can't come in. It just you don't want to do anything. You know, you sit at home on the couch and you do nothing. You know, I play Xbox, you know, grinding it out. I'm going to COD for a while. But, you know, some, some really hardcore brain stimulation stuff, right? But on that day, that's about 40 nanograms per deciliter. So a little bit lower. But what about the best day ever? What does that look like in a brain? You know, the day you win the lottery, you have 2% body fat, and you own an island, and that happens all at the same time? That day is about 100 nanograms per deciliter. 
All right, so that's the range we're supposed to live in. This is, you know, 40 is the horrible day, you don't want to do anything, and 100 is the best day ever. Uh, best food, your favorite food, actually is about 94 nanograms per deciliter. Sex is about 92. Bummer, but that's just <laughs> where the numbers roll. You know, data science and math, just how it rolls. But when we look at this, we know where we're supposed to live. And so really good days, you get 100. And we have appropriate feedback in the brain so that it lets us have that 100 every time we need the 100, and it'll push us down to 40 when we need that 40. But what happens when we mess with that system and we take something like methamphetamine? Well, instead of 100, what we do is we go up to 1,100 nanograms per deciliter, more than 10 times the, the highest amount that our brain is supposed to make. If you have heroin in the 900s, you have alcohol in the 7 to 900s, depending on genetics. You have marijuana in the 4 to 600, depending on genetics. Gambling, overeating, because glucose actually, for some people genetically predisposed, will behave not unlike heroin, as far as their dopamine response is, is, is seen. So if you have a genetic predisposition and you take these drugs and your dopamine goes up to 1,100, that's far past what normal reward is, because at 100, you look both ways before you cross the street. You pay attention to things around you. You'll still not make horrible decisions no matter how happy you are, right? You can still think. You can have that logical process of pros and cons. The minute we go above that during the intoxication phase when dopamine is up there, there's, those questions aren't being taken, aren't happening. We're not, we're not, we're not slapping the pros and cons list on the, on the uh, refrigerator after, you know, a hit of meth, right? Not a lot of that going on. So when we look at this, we know that the body's normal response to anything abnormal is to try to regulate. It doesn't like to be told what to do. So when you do this, it's 1,100, then it's 900, then it's 700, then five, then three, then one. And then even to get to that highest level in methamphetamine and cocaine, um, those, met, those will continue to pop you up to the 100 no matter what. The body's pretty resistant to those, but when you look at heroin or other opioids, the body will continue to decrease dopamine all the way down to where even when you use, you can't get to 40 or 50. So when people say, I am just using to feel normal, that is not a lie. They, they don't have a disproportionate sense of what normal is. They literally are not making enough dopamine to get out of bed and even fake vomit on the phone. And they require that drug in order to stimulate that dopamine. Now, if you use for a short amount of time, what we get is someone who just decreases the release of dopamine. Temporary, can pop back, you know, does a pretty good job of naturally reoccurring. If you use for longer and more intensely, then you decrease the amount you produce. Then you can decrease the size of the nerve, called atrophy. Then you can actually have what we call apoptosis, which is a, a, a cellular term for programmed cell death, meaning the body just starts to kill it. It is the equivalent of a stroke in the happy part of the brain. Because this is a very old part of the brain, it does not regenerate new neurons. Those don't come back once killed. So for patients who have used at a high level, are genetically predisposed, and consistently, these are patients who may never be able to make the normal amount of dopamine again. They may never have the 50, or even the 40, without augmentation of dopamine. And we know these parts of the brain, right? So the anterior cingulate gyrus, I'm walking down the street, I have an alcohol use disorder, I look over, I see the liquor store kind of unconsciously, and here I go, I walk over there. That's not a conscious decision, that was an unconscious decision regulated by the anterior cingulate gyrus. This actually skipped past, you know, the part of cognitive front lo frontal lobe. It shuts off the rest of this, goes straight to amygdala, which is really what's responsible for kind of our emotional response to cues, and you get a fear of if I don't go in, something bad's gonna happen. And so they just walk in. And then the nucleus accumbens gets a little bit of a bump. Just thinking about it, we'll get a little bit of a dopamine bump. What happens when you have a couple of beers and you, get a, and, and you don't have significant tolerance and you have a couple of beers and you, you get that little, I can now talk at a party, you're kind of greased and you're like, hey, what's up? I have 400 horrible things I can say right now that sound really stupid two beers ago. But now they're great you get into that kind of intoxication phase with dopamine and that also disinhibits just like the other thing does. So you disinhibit the normal regulatory pathway for behavior. So when we look at the amygdala and the ventral tegmental area which sends the dopamine up to the nucleus accumbens and stimulates 
And then we have periaqueductal gray. This is important because this is thought of as just a pain location. But this is probably one of the fundamental locations of uh, function for uh, naltrexone, which is Vivitrol, the injection that lasted blocks opioids. This is our main producer of internal opioids in the brain. Otherwise, it's produced mainly in the spine. So when we look at this, these are the parts that we have to know and understand. But more importantly, we already do. We know them, we know what they do, we know what the levels are, we know how they interact, we can predict behavior, which is really important. Because behavior is how we define the disease. We don't define it based on a urine toxicological study. So if you have lack of dopamine, right? We have that low dopamine, low motivation. That low motivation creates craving. Craving is for dopamine. The body knows that if it goes to this drug, it's gonna get dopamine. So it's craving fundamentally is for dopamine. Because remember, without it, you can't even get out of bed to go get food and water. And so that craving then turns into survival mode. I'm gonna die. I am gonna die if I don't get this. And then the primal action takes place. Grandma's credit card. Purchasing from someone. Doing horrible things that when you look back on them create the highest level of guilt of any patient set that I've ever seen in my life. Um, the things that they regret, and I, they tell me every time, the first thought I have in the morning is please don't let me use, followed directly by how quickly can I get something in me so I'm not in an active withdrawal. And that survival mode takes over. And that's important because when we look at the, the diagnosis as I talked about, these are all behaviors. This is how, how does the drug affect um, your social uh, places? Do, do you lose your job because of you, the drug? Do you choose the drug over um, a job? Do you choose the drug over family? Do you have a lack of control over how much you use, meaning you use one and then it turns into 10 or 20 or 30? These are the things that we look at. Do you inject with a needle that you know somebody with hepatitis C just used, trying to tell yourself that the risk is worth the benefit? And the brain does something interesting in this, and it shuts off the frontal lobe. We actually see in low dopamine states a significant decrease in frontal lobe interaction. It just doesn't allow for that cognitive list of pros and cons to take place. It is, I'm gonna die, I need to do, I just did. And that is the snap judgment pathway for this. So if the diagnosis is based on behavior, and aberrant behavior should be expected, right? The, the, the worse the behavior, the more affected the patient is. Um, we should therefore be seeing behavior as a symptom and not a frustration. But what do we do with this behavior in patients with addiction? We fire them from primary care, we put them in a hall bed in the ER, and then boot them as soon as they're, we're just sick of listening to them. We don't transport them on EMS. Families shut them out. Society shuts them out, we put them in jail. If you're brown or black, you definitely go to jail. I mean, these are just realities of the data, science, and math. This is not like my interpretation of it. This is just, it's there, this is put out there. And so behavior is the diagnosis. And so if somebody comes to my emergency department and they're saying I'm having crushing substernal chest pain and I'm 55 years old um, and I have a family history of cardiac disease, that person gets back immediately, right? They get evaluated and even if it's negative, the workup that, at that time, they generally get put in observation. They'll get an overnight you know, rule out, they'll get a stress echocardiogram, a call for a cardiologist, um, a whole bunch of people watching everything that they do. They get all these really newfangled, amazing tests. Um, what about the person who was just reversed from an opioid overdose and dropped into the emergency department? And this is nationally. I've been to pretty much every state in the country and hundreds of uh, hospital systems, and, and, and I, this is not, this is every place. You guys are actually very far ahead of the curve as far as uh, what Dr. Swartz is doing in your emergency department. But the, uh, the general aspect of this is, all right, you're breathing, you're alive. I know toxicologically you're gonna be safe, so get out. What's the 30-day mortality rate for that person as compared to a patient with a missed heart attack? So somebody who came in, I thought it was bogus chest pain, they got booted, the lab messed up the specimen so it came back as negative and they got you know, discharged. Who has a higher mortality rate? I mean, it's a trick question, right? I'm asking it in front of a large crowd talking about addiction. So obviously, the person who just got booted from the emergency department actually has a higher 30-day and 90-day mortality rate than a missed heart attack. Yet we bend over backwards for the, for the possibility of missing that missed heart attack, right? 
we have all these tests, we have specialists, we have this, but yet we're unwilling in most cases to even give buprenorphine in the emergency department, to even just to stop withdrawal, not even for treatment. What percentage of emergency departments routinely utilize uh, buprenorphine, which is the main medication for the treatment of acute withdrawal uh, that can be used in an emergency department, but also treatment and maintenance? What percentage of emergency departments uh, utilize this as a regular standard of care? Yeah, maybe eight total ERs, not percent. And that's the thing. So when we're talking about it, it's like not even enough to call it a percent. It's one of the, well, you know, it's a, it's a point zero something. It's probably another zero and then maybe a one, maybe. I mean, this is where we're at despite having this be a crisis, despite having 60 to 70,000 people die of opioid overdose every year. This is a preventable and treatable disease. So let's talk a little bit about craving because I really want you to understand that craving is not, I am craving for a super fun time at two o'clock in the morning. This is not, I want to party, right? The first time people use is the first time they use. That's the, that's the decision point. But if you have a genetic predisposition for this, each time after that, it becomes less of a decision and more of a need and a desire, right? So this is a, the first time, I mean, how many people when they were 15 years old, like cracked open a natty light in a, in a cul-de-sac? And I grew up in Texas, so that's you know, what we did. We all had all these unfinished like housing project places. So we'd go to the cul-de-sac at the end, crack open a 12 pack with like 14 of us and we're all like, I got a little bit of this. You know, out of, out of 10 of those people, two of them are gonna have a completely different experience with that alcohol than the rest of everybody. They're gonna have, the, the, the sky will brighten. Their world will become elucidated. They will be, this is what I'm searching for. And then that will push to that next one, a little less of a decision because that craving is so much for it. And then every time it just spins and spins and spins. So let's talk about food, water, and dopamine. And we've done, I haven't done, when I say we, the collective scientific we, so I can't take any uh, credit for these experiments. They're super cool though, so I will talk about them. So we looked at food, water, and dopamine, and how those actually change what craving looks like in the brain. And we have three different places in the brain that we looked, and it was pretty simple. So for food, you didn't eat for right around, what was it, uh, five days. So it was five days of no oral intake of food. You got IV fluids and some uh, multivites. And, uh, and then they put you in a functional MRI. They asked you what your favorite food was. They made you describe it. They literally brought it in and wafted it into the, the MRI tube, right? So you're smelling it. They made you taste it and spit it out and functionally MRI, MRI your brain afterwards, right? So we saw this and, and we saw with food, about a basketball size, um, relative size of craving in these areas of the brain. With water, they deprived people of water for three days and then came in and functionally MRI their brain after talking about waterfalls and playing water noises in the back and like sprinkling water on their feet and then letting them taste it and spit it out and functional MRI. That was about the relative size of a baseball. Now we know what happens when somebody is, is you know, dying of thirst or dying of hunger, right? So let's say I walk across the desert for three days, I have nothing in my system, I get to the end of this and there's this beautiful glass of water, right? It's like a liter, it's got condensation, it's like that Sprite commercial or it's like perfect. And I'm gonna go grab it and somebody steps in front of me and they say, that's my water. I'd be like, okay, stab. And I would move them over and I would take the water <laughs> and I would drink the water. Right? Because we know that that's what we have to do. We're going to survive. And quite honestly, the vast majority of us, you know, would justify that. I mean, my dad was an ex you know, force recon Marine, so he, he was like, oh, yeah, I'm totally on board with that. I'm like, all right, dad, calm down. <laughs> Seemed to get a little excited. His dopamine went up, and I was like, you're not an operator anymore. You're 71 and still working full time and works out five days a week. It's like, stop already. But when we do this, we looked at these, right? And so we found this, uh, you know, the baseball and the basketball. So what about when we looked at patients at 30 days, 90 days, um, one year, and two years after utilization of their drug of choice? And it was only done for alcohol and opioids, not for all of the rest of them. And we look at craving. So when we look at craving, we ask them two basic questions. And I'm only gonna talk about 30 days and two years because the signal intensity didn't change for two years. 
Meaning, we actually, they did see a non-significant, because it was a small number of people, a non-significant increase in the signal at 90 days of craving um, and at 120 days. So craving continued to go up. And this has um, also been validated at Mount Sinai with Yasmin Hurd's um, group. And they show that craving actually increases for the first year. And then only does it kind of level out and stabilize and only starts to improve around two years. And that's with medication-assisted treatment. So this is not in the blind. I mean, this is just what's going to happen. So when we give a person this at 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and one year, their relative craving as compared to a baseball or a baseball, uh, a basketball is a baseball field. So think about the size of a baseball sitting at home plate, the size of a basketball sitting on home plate, and then imagine the entire field. That's the difference in intensity of signal that they have for craving in these areas, and it shuts off frontal lobe capacitation. It fires up the lateral bed nuclei of the amygdala, which is our fear center. So they are fearful of death, fearful of withdrawal, fearful of not having that dopamine. And whatever their drug of choice is, dopamine is that. So their motivation to get that is through the roof because for them it is purely survival. So what about the patients that we get in for, uh, that are stable, right? So we get them in and we find that they're stable. When we get those patients in, why do people relapse? Let's say they're doing really well and, and they do this. Early we found the literature actually in uh, the criminal justice system helped us out with this. And then it moved into the medical literature, but it wasn't on patients. It was on parole boards followed by providers. What they found is that the more decisions you make throughout a day, the less likely you are to make a difficult decision um, at the end of the day. And what I mean by that is the default is whatever I'm doing now, not different. So they looked at this in the parole board side and they said, if, you were, if your parole was evaluated in the morning, you were 40% more likely to be paroled as compared to the afternoon. And that's when they corrected and controlled for all of the extenuating circumstances and age and race and all of those things. And they found that it was decision fatigue. By the end of the day, you're just less likely to take a chance, right? You're less likely to be like, I know you took out three people, but you've been here for a while. Let's roll the dice. Let's go with that. No, they're going to say, you're in, you're staying in. And then we looked at medical providers. And this is probably what happened with the, the long hours. And, uh, and so with the long hours, over time, you have to make a number of decisions. And by the end, you're going to make whatever the easiest decision is. There was actually one publication, uh, I think it needs to be redone because it was a really good concept, but it was in emergency medicine and it showed towards the end of the shift, um, we x-ray a whole lot more stuff. So we CAT scan and we lab and we do everything at the end of the shift because we just can't make those complex clinical decisions by the end of a 12 hour shift or even an eight hour shift. And in fact, the ideal shift in an emergency department should probably be six hours for actual productivity and cognitive capability. But what we saw is, all right, I'm fine, I can look at this, you know, this, um, there's this book called The Rape of Emergency Medicine, kind of described as you go around the, the bed like you're a, a hunting, you know, cat, and you're just like thinking about what's going on. That turns into a drive-by, and I'm like, yeah, CT, abdomen, pelvis, with, without, um, and I need a CBC, CMP, and a, you know, PTINR. None of those are needed because they just have crampy belly pain and a couple of, you know, days of diarrhea. But you get to the end, and, and that changes. So this happens in patients in recovery especially without medication-assisted treatment. Because in the morning, they wake up and their first thought is what? Please don't let me use. And then they're in recovery, so their next thought is also, please don't let me use. Please don't let me use. God, please don't let me use. Please don't let me use. Don't let me use. Don't let me use. And then they have to go outside to go to the store for something at 4 o'clock after 400 decisions of no, and then all they do is walk by someone who has it, and they're like, okay, fine. And it's not because they wanted it. They weren't looking for it. They went to go get bread, right? But drug dealers are relentless, man. They have your phone number, they will call you, they will text you, they will come to your house, they will knock on your door. They will not let you go. So for our patients, when we saw them, the first thing we did was we crushed their SIM card. We come in, you wanna get better? Yeah, you really wanna get better? Yeah, give me your SIM card. And then we knew how, how much better they wanted to get. Cause there's nobody on that phone at that point that's helpful. There might be one. And that one, that one person's probably about done emotionally. Right? Because all the calls they've gotten have been, I need, I need, I need, I need, I want, I want, I want. And so they're generally emotionally done. So we pull out the SIM card and throw it because we want to decrease that rip, risk of relapse. So that's kind of the cycle of what we look at. Now let's get into what do we do for this. So what about the treatments? The concept of treatment is pretty clear. Since lack of dopamine 
is what really causes the craving, which causes the continued utilization of the drug, and that craving comes from a lack of motivation or a lack of, I'm not gonna say it, dopamine, right? So we have this lack of dopamine, a lack of motivation, and this craving that comes up because if we don't have dopamine, we're not gonna be able to even get out of bed and get food and water. I mean, how many people, patients, parents, uh, providers have had someone who showed up basically in the pajamas they put on three days ago and I haven't gotten out of them. And we're like, why can't you just put on clothes to come to the office? And we go angry like it's some personal affront to us. I, they are, their new normal of dopamine is not 50 or 40. Their new normal is 20. And when they wake up and they're having a bad day, it's 10. And that's barely enough dopamine to literally motivate to get out of bed to go to the bathroom. And so if we don't replace dopamine, then we're in trouble. And this is exactly what buprenorphine and methadone do. Buprenorphine and methadone replace dopamine to normal levels. If dosed in the normal dosing pattern, all it does is go to 50. You don't get 100, you don't get 200, you don't get 300. Now that changes if people are boosting, and we can dig into that a little bit, but if, if somebody's taking buprenorphine and methadone, the goal of this is just dopamine replacement therapy. What other things do we do for, for this, right? We do this for almost every other co chronic condition that we manage. If you have depression, we give you a, an SSRI because we're trying to replace and stabilize serotonin. And over time, if we do therapy and we do this and you're stable for two years, maybe we can get the, the medication off. But for a portion of people, you can't. They require that extra stimulation of, of serotonin. What about people who have uh, neuropathic pain and need more norepinephrine in their spinal cord? We give them an SNRI, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. And so we add norepinephrine to the system. What about people who don't make enough uh, insulin? We give them insulin. What's the difference here? If a patient eats a box of Krispy Kremes who's a type one diabetic and shows up to the office with a blood sugar of 600, what happens? We see them, we treat them, we give them the 17th referral to nutrition and, and we hope that they're gonna to follow up. Not realizing that the treatment pathway is not about more education, it's about understanding. And if you understand the pathway for that, um, and we take the time in a patient with diabetes, but we definitely don't do that for patients with addiction. They show up and they have something in their urine that's not supposed to be there, and we call it dirty, which by the way, we need to scrub that terminology. It is positive or negative? Positive or negative, positive or negative, right? A negative test is everything in the urine is expected. A positive test is there's something unexpected, either the absence of a drug that we're giving them or the presence of something we didn't want positive and negative. A patient is also not clean or dirty. A patient is either in remission or actively has a substance use disorder, right? No clean and dirty. I mean, again, to the diabetic, if they have a box of Krispy Kremes, we're not calling them a dirty diabetic. You know, that's not what they were talking about, riding dirty when we were talking about that, right? It's not that, it's not like he's got you know, a dozen Krispy Kremes in the back. That's not what it is. So when we look at this, clean and dirty are just not useful terms. Positive and negative. The DSM-5 diagnosis of uh, mild, moderate, or severe opioid use disorder in remission on opioid replacement therapy. That's an actual diagnosis. That's a coded diagnosis. That's a medical diagnosis. How often does that actually get coded in emergency departments or primary care? Less than 1% of charts have it anywhere, and less than 0.00 something charts actually have it listed as um, a primary diagnosis. I would argue that it is the primary diagnosis until otherwise stated. Because you're not gonna actually be able to impact that diabetes, that COPD, that hypertension, um, until you take care of the opioid use disorder. And people generally don't miss work or school because their blood pressure's up. But they will absolutely miss school because they have addiction. And they will not go to work because they have addiction. So when we look at this, we have to take into account all of that, and then let's bust a few myths, all right? Let's, let's, let's blow through this. So if I say 95% of people who go into inpatient abstinence-based treatment are stable at one year, is that a true statement? Yes. Well, listen to this. You get, you're, 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 I see some people getting angry, like they're gonna throw darts. Let me finish. <laughs> All right, hold off, hold, put the fruit back. Put the, uh, so yes, what about if I say patients who are in inpatient abstinence-based treatment have 8% good outcomes at one year. Is that true? So 92% failure, 95% positive. 
Is, are those true? How do those occur? Those are both true statements. It's just that the 95% of people, the one that shows 95% were doctors, pilots, and lawyers. It is who you apply it to. In Florida, they have a 95% five-year um, remission rate for alcohol use disorder and opioid use disorder with abstinence-based treatment. The reason being, it's a different brain disease. Because the vast majority of people who live over in this part, which is the vast majority of people and those in which I saw the most of, they started when they were 12 and 14. They more likely had significant early life trauma. They more likely had sexual assault. They more likely um, had access over other things when it started. They more likely had a significant genetic predisposition. They more likely didn't have a disability package that paid them full salary while they're getting better. They most likely didn't have an ecosystem around them with family and friends and neighbors that supported them through this process. Those are two different worlds, and so I will not talk today for the rest of the day about doctors, pilots, and lawyers. It is a different subset analysis, a different group. So we will sit with the ones that if you apply them to, I'm gonna detox you and you're gonna go, you're just gonna suck it up. Man, that is malpractice. That is ridiculous. And in fact, there are now um, a significant number of appropriate lawsuits being filed against states, providers, and, uh, um, and behavioral health providers, and all of those that refuse to pay for evidence-based treatment. And there's a mortality associated with it. Because the mortality rate doesn't have to happen. Because the things in which we do have evidence, they work, and they get them back to remission, which is they're normal, not super normal. If somebody says, I need my, my prescription for Oxy because on Saturday, it makes me, it's the only thing that gives me energy to get everything done. And I'm like, nobody has energy to get everything done on Saturday. That's wrong, that's a problem. What you need is enough to get up and do the basic things and then you should get really lazy around noon or three, really have to fight back taking a nap or just give in and like take a nap. You know, plug your kids into the tablet and be like, oh, daddy's checking out for a minute. I gotta go do some work in the basement. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, I mean, that's, you can do that, but that's, that's normal. It's not like, all right, I'm gonna wake up and finish everything on the list that's been on there for four months. So that's normal, and so we have to understand what the normal is and what it isn't. Location of treatment is important, and it's more important to know that more expensive is not better. Outpatient treatment is just as effective at one year as inpatient treatment for the cohort of patients that I'm talking about. Behavioral health interventions. Evidence-based uh, behavioral health interventions are cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy with those patients who have addiction and a personality disorder. Contingency management strategies are probably the most effective treatment we have for stimulants. Mindfulness-based therapies have actually been shown to be really helpful for that anxiety associated with that pre-craving feeling uh, that people have. But what happens in this is we say that somebody's getting cognitive behavioral therapy, they go into a room and close the door and we have no idea what happens. And in many times when we've done evaluations of this, what we get is chit-chat therapy. We get rent a friend for six months, then you've used up your visits and goodbye. We haven't built coping strategies, we haven't stabilized a thought process, we haven't given them kind of a, a mindset to be able to walk through those things. Instead, you're like, how you doing? Oh, that's good. We'll just keep on doing that. And that conversation happens in cyclical fashion for an hour and then they're done. But what portion of uh, master's level therapists actually have specific addiction training? Again, less than 20, uh, 10 when you when you look at the curriculum uh, delivered by master's level LCSW um, trained individuals and even uh, psychologists. So don't think that you're going to just go to a psychologist because it's it sounds ologist. And and when you go to an ologist, it must be better. That it, it's no different. They still don't get effective and appropriate addiction training in their standard curriculum. Let's walk through these quickly. Evidence-based treatment. Evidence, so what I mean by evidence is that someone has done a randomized controlled trial on a population. They have done an appropriate, what we call subset analysis to make sure that we can identify those that it definitely doesn't work for. Are there a population that sits in there that this is not really helpful for? The best evidence has enough of those that you can do a meta-analysis, which is a pooling of all of those good studies and you can get an average result. And the best studies have multiple meta-analyses that you can put together so that you end up on Cochrane level database, right? So if it's there and it says to do, then that pretty much means the evidence is on side. This is level A evidence, which means that if you don't do it, it's malpractice. 
All right, so what I'm going to talk about is the level of evidence. Opioids. And again, we have evidence-based treatment for uh, opioids, alcohol, we have some for marijuana, and uh, we have stimulant uh, treatment for contingency management. So while I know that opioids is the reason we're here today, it is not the largest addiction. Alcohol is. In fact, if you add up all of the other addictions, alcohol still outflanks it. So when we talk about building an opioid treatment system, that is a waste of time. We need to build an addiction treatment system because right after opioids, when we get our handle on this, marijuana is right behind it. It's the number one cause of admission to adolescent treatment programs, marijuana use disorder. So you can tell yourself all the happy stuff you want about it. We're still going to have to deal with this. Opioids, you have methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. And let's focus on those a little bit. So methadone is the most studied of all of these. It started back in the 70s, was wavered in the uh, um, Controlled Substances Act in the 80s so that you could deliver it for uh, maintenance. And uh, there's over a thousand studies on this. And so the data has started to tighten. You know, when you, when you first do a study, you may have one that shows low, one that shows high. And then as you get more studies, things start to coalesce and slowly come together to where, you know, no matter where you do it, it's a pretty tight result. And this one levels out between 60 at the low end and 80 at the high end. Most, most of these are 70%. And the outcomes that are agreed upon in addiction is uh, consistency in treatment. So if you stayed in treatment for that period of time, because that's associated with a lot of positive outcomes. It's not, is your urine uh, positive or negative? It is, are you still in treatment, engaged in treatment at one year? And that's what we look at. So I don't know if it's the medication or if it's the way in which it's delivered that actually gives us the benefit. We know the medication is helpful. I don't know if it's superior to buprenorphine because for methadone, you have to come in and get dosed every day. You walk in, you get dosed. You walk in, you get dosed. You're assessed, you dose. They titrate the dose based on your uh, behaviors and your uh, uh, stability of your disease. But methadone is interesting. And in most crowds, um, you can hear kind of a collective moan when I even say methadone. I'm like, so we're going to talk about methadone. You got a few like, oh, methadone. You don't hear that about like a calcium channel blocker at a cardiology conference, right? <laughs> like nobody's like, now we're going to talk about calcium channel blockers. And everybody's like, no, I'm out of here. <laughs> that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen because we have some weird emotional connection to, to the treatment of addiction. And a lot of it stems back to what was said earlier, is the vast majority of us have a connection to someone who's either had or has an addiction. And it is always a frustrating thing because remember, behavior is the symptom of choice. And so that behavior starts to grate on people who don't understand the disease, which creates kind of this predisposed thought process. And again, we also have this preconceived notion that people are doing a pros and cons list on the refrigerator, which we just know is not true. So, so this is not a choice. And people just need to make better choices. Well, you just need to read a book. I mean, this is, I'm starting to get kind of frustrated about this because at the end of the day, we have science data and math to back up what we're talking about here. And we need to let um, religion not be the evidence base that we use, but the way in which we can deliver the evidence. And if you have a belief system, it's perfectly fine to capture the evidence within that and deliver it. But the religion can't be your evidence base for what you treat. And so we have to be very careful about what we're calling evidence and what we're calling, I guess, modality. And so with this, Methadone is still the standard of care. It is the standard of care for patients with a heroin use disorder who've definitely had it for greater than six months, and that number's backing off because we don't want to wait six months. We're using heroin two months? Uh, let's give it another four months and see how you're doing. That, that doesn't work, but if you look at the federal regs, I mean, they actually had a one-year time in there before you should be eligible for methadone, but actually we're finding that for people who inject this, um, it has a significant outcome. So what are the caveats of methadone? Because nothing is perfect. And one is it's generally not available in really rural areas. I mean, they don't have opioid treatment programs or uh, methadone clinics out in the middle of uh, um, rural or, or, or remote areas. It just it doesn't occur. Um, despite having the best outcomes, again, it has the highest level of stigma. If you, don't, if you can't get to it, so even if you have one, if it has to be like six buses and like an hour and a half to get there in the morning and then another hour and a half to get back, you can't actually have a job or take care of your kids or do those things if you have to you know, spend three hours traveling to get dosed. So there's some practical aspects. Um, and it seems to be pretty hard to get patients off after a few years if they are this very small subset that can get off. And this, we'll talk about what maintenance versus uh, taper looks like. Um, so how does this compare to buprenorphine? So buprenorphine is kind of, uh, it's newer. It has a little over 100 studies, so not 1,000 studies, a little over 100. It's got quite a few meta-analyses of those studies. And it ranges between 45 and 65% effective. 
So in the right place, it can be as effective as methadone. And I think that has to do more with what team do you have in place um, and uh, what are the modalities in which you're delivering it as compared to just the drug itself. And, uh, and, and so we know that this one is nice because we can actually use it in primary care or in an emergency department, whereas methadone has to be used in a certified opioid treatment program. Now, the DEA um, still calls it an NTP, a narcotic treatment program. They haven't even updated their, um, you know, their regs for the last 15 years on, on how to approach these things, which is also a big disconnect that we have. But there's still some variability in the way this is done. Are there, are there offices that just write buprenorphine and do nothing else? Yeah. Are there offices that, are there opioid treatment programs that just give methadone and don't really, they phone in the therapy, they don't really do it much, they don't really assess the patient? Uh, it's what they call a candy shop, which means it doesn't matter what's in your, Europe, you know, your urine, you can just show up and still get your dose and do that. Do those exist? They do. So let's talk about that. Let's say that that was all of them. What is the risk benefit of a bad one versus none? So a bad one where they just give you drugs and they don't do anything else. Still, and I'm not advocating for this, in fact, I've shut down methadone clinics and reopened better ones in their place, but the, uh, we have to understand that just the medication itself decreases risk of HIV, hepatitis C, getting arrested, being involved in the court system, losing your job, losing your children. All of these are things that just by giving the medication, we change. There's no other medication that does that. There is no other medication that changes your work capability on a regular basis. There's no other medication other than post-exposure prophylaxis that changes your ability to get HIV, right? There's nothing that decreases that. Now, hepatitis C, we can treat $90,000 to treat it. So do you do that or do you do seven years of evidence-based addiction treatment? I mean, these are easy math problems that seem to get really jumbled up in the, do I subtract or add? I mean, it's not calculus, for goodness sake. I mean, this stuff is pretty straightforward. So when we look at buprenorphine, absolutely has benefit even done poorly, and that's about 45%. We should be looking at quality and effective performance measures for people delivering it so that we can get that up to the 65%, because there's no reason to do a crappy job. And then you start to waver on the ethical stance of if you're just giving this drug, how much different are you than really the dealer that they were seeing before? I mean, we have to have that conversation because it's very real and I have, very eth I have significant ethical issues with those that feel like, well, at least I'm doing harm reduction. And they start with at least. That's just step one in addiction treatment, right? That's still not active abatement of the disease long term. It definitely still does all of those things. And so I would rather have a bad methadone clinic than no methadone clinic. I would rather have a buprenorphine pill mill did not an availability to it. And I would do that based purely on the data, not some sycophantic, you know, tree hugger thing. I mean, this is just that it saves lives, it saves families, it saves money, even if done poorly. We should strive to have it be done perfectly. Um, pharmacology of this, it's weird. We learned some crazy, crazy stuff in medical school um, that's complicated. This is somehow a, like a block for a lot of people, a partial agonist versus a full agonist. It is not rocket science. We need to make sure that we start teaching this early as a part of pharmacology and moving forward. Uh, diversion is a very real issue, but at the same time, mostly we found that the more access somebody has to buprenorphine, the less diversion that happens in that um, community. So you increase access, you have decreased diversion. You have decreased access, you have increased diversion, because most people are using it just to not withdraw. There are some people who have that as their primary drug of choice. I've treated two myself, where buprenorphine was their drug of choice. They had a predisposition to have that cause that euphoria. Fine, we won't use that for treatment. We have other pathways. So what about naltrexone? Naltrexone is the opposite of those, and it blocks dopamine. So if, if I'm blocking opioids, I'm blocking dopamine, and that's kind of what happens. You're not allowing it to go up because the opioid pathway is the main way in most people that dopamine goes up. So if this doesn't augment dopamine, which I said is the whole foundation for the treatment of these patients, why do we use it? Is it helping motivation? Maybe. I would say the data is unclear on that. 
It depends on the patient population. We're right back to where we started, right? We have doctors, pilots, and lawyers. We have those with early life trauma, early onset um, adolescent utilization, and that. I, I was the number one prescriber in Michigan of this drug, so this is not a me against this drug by any stretch. I, I think that this is an amazing medication when used and applied to the right people. And again, we're gonna come back to dopamine and motivation. On the insert of this medication, it says works best in patients who have a um, high degree of motivation. What does that mean they have? Dopamine, they're naturally making dopamine. That means when they hug their kid, they get a little bit happy. Probably less happy than they would prior, but they still can naturally produce that dopamine. These are patients who it's perfect for. These are patients who they're making enough dopamine. We don't necessarily need to augment it, and this may be a medication we wanna use. But I have to say, when we're looking at the data science part, while methadone had 1,000 studies and buprenorphine had 100, this has less than 10 studies in the general population. Do we change entire behaviors in medicine based on less than 10 studies? I mean, rarely do we do this, except for illnesses that absolutely life end, um, you know, will, will decrease your life expectancy. And so this is why we've probably started using it, because we feel like this is a risk. But it's not the evidence-based treatment for the vast majority of patients to start. Some patients, absolutely. There are some patients where we would give it at first. Those that have been uh, um, stable in, in what I would say remission. Now, what is remission when you're in jail? Can you have the disease, an active form of the disease of addiction without actually using the substance? Yeah. You can meet those behaviors, and they have to do with craving and seeking. If that person is doing everything that they can to try to get something imported in and paying who they can and doing what they can to try to get it, they're not stable. They're not making dopamine. That craving is making them do things that's not, not that. So that's a person who probably even at leaving jail would be better uh, with a buprenorphine or methadone program. People who are motivated, who have gone through, still have some dopamine production and have that, those are people that we can absolutely bridge them for that 30 days to get them into treatment and then we can redetermine the pathway that we wanna go. And for the criminal justice population, it's great for that 30 days because it does buy you some time, especially if we have good uh, parole officer case management and we can get them to where they need to go. But it is unethical to have this be the only medication available for a patient. At this point, it is malpractice to wean somebody off of buprenorphine when they're not stable and start them on this, especially in a detox pathway. The two-week detox to naltrexone is unethical. Let me say that again. The two-week detox to naltrexone off of buprenorphine is unethical unless you are the 1% of people who already make appropriate dopamine. If you are not that person, we are killing them. And I'm not overstating that. I'm not trying to be sick of fan. I mean, this is just the data and the science. The risk of relapse and retention rate when used, uh, we'll get to questions on, on the panel, so keep that. But the, uh, when we have relapse, Relapse happens because of craving. If we're not stamping down craving, that means we're not doing a good job stabilizing dopamine, which means that we need to put them on a medication that stabilizes dopamine so that we can get them involved in the other stuff. So again, it ranges from 23 to 60%. I will say that the 60% number is the highest. That was a Russian study uh, where nothing else is available um, in their country, and there were some integers like basically, uh, the, and I wish we could see this a little bit in the US where they had like mothers and grandmothers dragging people to this clinic to get um, their injections. Um, a little bit of a different community involvement than I've seen in a lot of our, our places, um, but um, it needs more study. It is gonna be really effective. And it's perfect for a medication for people with both an alcohol and an opioid use disorder. So what does the community do? So the community does stigma reduction. Stigma reduction, stigma reduction, stigma reduction. Because actually it's moved past stigma. And what does it become? What do we call it when we see a person and we say they look a certain way, and so we stereotypically drop a set of values on them based on what they look like. Prejudice, discrimination, that's what this is. We, we label the patient based on something they have, and we discriminate against them for the treatment that we would otherwise provide for any other disease. We do this on a regular basis. And then when you add on top of this, the discrimination that we see within the criminal justice system, you know, for people who are black or brown, those are people who absolutely um, get the worst of this. And that's why when 50% of the population, you know, in most places sits, um, you know, with a uh, non, you know, Anglo-Saxon white, you know, person, but yet 85 to 90% of the people in jail for drug-related crimes 
are those people, that's discrimination. And it's stacked because we continue to discriminate against them in the emergency departments and in the hospitals and in the primary cares and in the surgeries. So here's the ecosystem required to fix this, right? It's not a clinic. It's not a medication. It's not a service. Every other, if I walk into the hospital and I have a heart attack, I can get everything from a pat on the back to a balloon pump, right? I can go to the ICU, they can helicopter me from across the state to get me to a place that can do something. Uh, I mean, I've cut people's chests open and sewn up hearts and done this stuff. And, and we've done all this and we just know that it's there. So what happens if you have a massive heart attack and you needed a balloon pump and we put in an LVAD, right? For those of you not medical, that's, I don't know, half a million dollars worth of work or more on a patient. And, and that patient then goes to cardiac rehab. And then that patient goes from cardiac rehab to outpatient cardiac rehab. And the patient follows up with the specialist, the cardiologist. They follow up with their primary care. They probably go to the urologist. They see an electrophysiologist. They see all of the ologists that they can get a hold of. What about our patients? Yeah. If all we do is at the top of this list and we just say, oh, yeah, we're good, man. We got MAT. Failure. Oh, we have a good outpatient treatment program. Failure. Hospital-based strategy. Failure. Inpatient detox. Failure. IOP. Failure. Behavioral health treatment. Failure. Recovery maintenance. Failure. All of the above. Appropriate. We have it for every other freaking medical disease. Every other one, except for addiction. I think I want to leave you with why. And that's not a question I can answer for you guys. That's something you have to answer on your own. But we have people in this state that are working really hard to build this system and this ecosystem. You have a $20 million grant you know, from the federal government to, to help change what this whole system looks like. You have $5 million from SAMHSA you know, that actually has come in just for prevention and putting in programs for naloxone distribution and, and saving a life so that somebody doesn't have to die from their preventable disease. You have a lot of programs that are starting to work at the state level. And, and so we have to support them. This is a team sport. This is not a doctor does, or a social worker does, or an inpatient program does. This is a we do, right? If it's not a we do, it doesn't get done. So I would challenge everybody in this room, I don't care if you're a bench top neuromolecular scientist who sits there and does that, you should figure out how you can actually help somebody learn about addiction. You should, you should figure out how you can interact with the medical school to give that first year talk on neuroscience about addiction so that they can understand the reward system and why that changes to behavior. You should talk to the psychiatrist and the, and the therapist. If you're the person who is, a, is the patient who has, um, you know, it, in recovery and addiction or an active addiction, use your voice. You know, thank you for yours. That was really helpful. Because if you don't understand this, these are real people who have these issues that we have a real capability to help. And it is only us standing in the way of that. So with that, I will leave it till the end. Thanks.